Um, again, that's out in Post Falls out here. And what we do is we advocate for people to live as independently as possible. We do that through assistive technology, peer support, um, information and referral, and the resources uh, to connect people. Um, and advocacy, or I mean, um, and accessibility out in the public. Um, and um, the staff there is Sherry, was not here tonight because of a family situation. Um, and she's the new coordinator at DAC. Um, and Bev and Bonnie are the independent living advocates out there. And, um, and then Yvonne does uh, the independent, or the um, first choice personal attendance services. And again, my name is Michelle. Um, so this is Jeremy, and he is at the Maine State Independent Living Center out in Boise. And he um, has flown all the way here to uh, for this event, and um, he'll be speaking afterwards. And um, then we'll be doing some, um, passing out some information that's in the back back there. So, um, Thank you, Chief Merritt, for having this room available to us after hours. So he actually has to stay throughout this whole event to close up afterwards. So I just thought that was pretty amazing of him. And so um, in the event of emergency, um, what? Wow. <laughs> emergency. <laughs> emergency. <laughs> Um, so, in the event of an emergency, what do you do typically? Yell for help. You, yeah, you yell for help. You want communication. You want to communicate to somebody that you need help. So, um, what happens if you don't have your cell phone? I'm so sorry. Um, so, if your cell phone doesn't work, um, one of the things that you can do, don't laugh at me, is you can connect an old school phone into your wall jack. And that will actually still call 911. Um, and then if you don't, and then the next thing that you can do is you could use your C, uh, if you happen to have one, you can have a CB radio. And a CB radio is nice because you can take that with you in your vehicle and it can go anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 miles depending on the antenna or the range that you have. Or you could get long distance walkie talkies and I saw some of the long distance walkie talkies, there were 10 of them for $100. So that's really inexpensive. You can give them out to your neighbors um, and they're great for if you're out on a trail with your family or, or whoever uh, for safety reasons. Um, CB radio, you can get it from anywhere from like 30 to much higher uh, price than that. Um, so that's a relatively low cost. And then um, if you wanna go a little longer distance, you can do the ham radio. Um, the thing with the ham radio is that you have to have a license in order to do that. And um, there's actually a group, it's called CARS, and they are in Coeur d'Alene at the sheriff um, station, um, search and rescue. Um, and that is in Coeur d'Alene, and they are um, every mo second Monday of every single month. And I went there last month and it was a pretty pretty nice group out there. Um, and it's a really fun way to get to know other people and the more ham radio users or, or any equipment that you use, um, the easier it is to use it, um, the equipment in our, in our area because that has more antennas. <laughs> um, so, um, wow, I really went through that fast. Um, communications. <laughs> Uh, devices can be fun and they're a great way to get to know other people. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about tonight is um, Chief DeRyder has come up with a form um, for the fire department um, and he's going to talk to you about that and if you guys are interested you could go ahead and sign up um, and so I'm going to pass the mic over to him. <coughs> So a few weeks ago, I got a phone call from this nice young lady here about uh, how do people with disabilities let dispatch know in case of emergency how you know what's going on. Um, 
And we kind of talked about it, and then I did a little research, and there we came up with a, a premise history form. So I can't take credit for all the language in here, but I can tell you it's legal. <laughs> I had our legal look at it. Uh, I got in touch with our dispatch center. Dispatch looked at it, and they said that they're legal, and then we're all legal as of yesterday. So what the form, the form will cover ADA disabilities, and it's four pages long, so if you don't need to fill all of it out, you don't have to, but it covers the gamut. It's all voluntary, and it has to be signed, otherwise we cannot use it in our dispatch center. Um, this form will be on our website, which is cdafire.org. It'll be on the left-hand side. It'll be uh, called ADA Disability Form. You'll download it, print it out, fill it out. You can either scan it, email it back to us, the email that's on the form, or you can mail it, and then we will get it to dispatch. And if you email it to us, we'll get it to dispatch as well. But what dispatch will do is they will take the information that you give us on this form, <coughs> and it's tied to your address. So if there's a fire, if there's a police emergency, or if there's a medical emergency, whatever information you give us will show up on our MDT. And the MDT is our mobile data terminal, terminal that is in our apparatus. And all the information is right there for, for the address and then anything that's on this form. So let's say you're, you have a house fire, you're in the back bedroom, you're wheelchair bound, you can't get to your wheelchair, the fire's in the hallway, whatever. It will let us know on our MDTs that somebody that is confined to a wheelchair <coughs> is in the house. Um, so we know that information up front. None of the information will be broadcast over the air. It'll all just be on our, our MDTs. Any questions so far? <coughs> So, Kootenai County, but Post Falls, we'll have to talk to Post Falls Dispatch. <coughs> so that will be, I'm sure if Kootenai uh, Central Dispatch is doing it, they're going to be right on board with it. So, um, but right now, yeah, Coeur d'Alene, anywhere in Kootenai County, uh, if you are in Post Falls, we'll talk to Post Falls. Yes. Any other questions? This is good for two years. So every two years, you will have to update it. Dispatch does have the ability to put an expiration date on there. Um, if you move, you need to update this. That way we don't tie you to a different address or we're going to an address and you no longer live there. Um, but yeah, anything you want to put on this. I made 20, well, I got 25 copies. So if you guys would like one, I can hand them out. Uh, but I've been assured tomorrow morning they'll be on our website. All that in here as well. Um, we had. I'm wondering if the Autism <coughs> Society has reached out to fire. Oh. To, no. No. Okay. We in, we had a, cl a class earlier this year from the Isaac Foundation. Okay, out of Washington. Out of Washington, okay. and they have a form on their website, and she was trying to get us to get that into our central dispatch, and I don't know what the issues were with that, but this the form this form will cover everything from autism. Okay. You know, that is great. Yeah, and you can look at this one. Our young adults will go and hide. Yep, that's covered on here. Okay, thank you. That's great. Yeah. So, uh, Bill, so we can share that with any of our um, groups that we work with yes. that people want to um, put information on there for their own safety. Yep, and we're sharing this with all the fire departments, and I'm sure they're going to put them on all their websites as well. But right now, you can direct them to our website and, and get it out. And just to clarify, that is not any type of notification, warning system of anything. It's not like once they sign up there that then they're signed up for like alert Kootenai. Oh, no. Right. Nope. Okay. Nope. It's any time there's a medical, police, or fire emergency at your residence. 
Super, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody want one? Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to thank everyone for turning out this evening. I know there's a million things that we can all be doing. The weather's getting colder, it's dark. Uh, there's a lot of motivation to stay inside warm in front of the TV, and it's just great to see folks who've turned out, um, who care about being prepared and making sure that we're keeping people in our communities independent. Um, I also want to thank the Kootenai County Fire and Rescue uh, for allowing us to use this building just again. This is an incredible uh, facility and an incredible asset for this county and the area. And uh, y'all are, you know, I'm from the big city down south, but y'all are really lucky to have this here. It's just, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's great to do this presentation here tonight, so thank you for that. Um, my name is Jeremy Maxhand, and I'm, the, I'm a program specialist with the Idaho State Independent Living Council. And, and uh, basically, it's a state agency that is focused on uh, promoting independent living philosophy around the state. And we support the work that independent living centers like uh, DAC Northwest, um, their mission and the work they do in the different regions around the state. And basically we're focused on making sure that people um, have their individual choice, self-determination, and access in our communities. And that's uh, what we do. Um, my specific job is to uh, basically provide public education on emergency preparedness. Um, a little bit about me, I uh, grew up in uh, southeast Alaska on a little island called Wrangell. Uh, in the middle of the Tongass National Forest. And if you follow the biosphere ecosystem from here, kind of northwest up into Alaska, uh, you'll end up in my backyard. So it's really neat to be up here and around the trees and the woods and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, I ended up in a wheelchair when I was about 15. I got something called transverse myelitis. It's really kind of rare, but it you know put me out of commission in terms of uh, climbing trees and mountains and all that sort of stuff. Um, and living on an island in a really isolated place in Southeast Alaska, um, you know, being prepared, although people didn't talk about, you know, prepping and being prepared, it was just kind of something that you had to think about um, be because, you know, your food often, you know, if you didn't hunt fish, your food came in on barges. There were only two planes that came in a day. Um, and so you're really isolated and kind of dependent on the outside world. So, um, this job is a great fit for me because I'm really passionate about being prepared and thinking about um, how do you stay independent, how do you stay safe, and how do you support uh, other people in your community who have disabilities. Um, I'm also a certified ADA coordinator, so I kind of bring that perspective to the table, which is um, you know, knowing how to assess and audit buildings and programs and services for accessibility. We have another ADA coordinator here, which is great um, this evening. And uh, let's see, so tonight what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna talk about what it means to be uh, prepared for an emergency or disaster if you have a disability. And we're gonna, anybody wanna take a, a guess as to why this is important for us to get together and talk about tonight? And feel free to just blurt it out or raise your hand. Bringing awareness. Awareness. Educating others, specifically for folks with disabilities, what do you think is a real important reason why we're talking about this? To know their options. So people know their options. Um, if you, one of the things that we learned at, at, after Katrina and during some of the major hurricanes in Texas and the fires in California at um, uh, in Paradise, the campfire, was that. People with disabilities and older adults are really impacted at a much higher rate than uh, just your average able-bodied folks who, who don't have disabilities. So if you look at the statistics from the fire in California, you'll see that uh, overwhelmingly uh, the people who were you know, injured and were, or ended up losing their lives um, were people who were older or folks who have disabilities. They had trouble getting out. Um, getting rides, moving quickly, um, all that sort of stuff. And we also know that in a disaster, people with disabilities who um, are displaced from their communities, who live independently, often end up being institutionalized and never make it back home. So for, um, you know, for folks who don't deal with those issues, uh, a disaster can be pretty bad in terms of losing your house or maybe your, the business that you worked at. 
Um, but eventually you get to rebuild and move back. But for folks who have disabilities, that can really be a life-changing and a life-ending um, um, experience. And so it's, it's, it's really important that um, we know and take personal responsibility to keeping ourselves safe and independent and that we provide input to the people in our community who are doing planning and, and, and looking out for us in the county and at the state level so that they are empowered with as much information as possible um, to help us in the best way that, that we need that kind of help. Um, and so that's really why it's important that we're talking about this and we're talking with our first responders and our emergency planners um, and, and our support systems about being prepared for an emergency. Um, being prepared if you have a disability also, uh, you know, it's just also a, a peace of mind, right? So you know that you're, you, you, you've got your, you know, your supplies, you're ready to go. If you end up in a shelter or if you have to s shelter in place, um, you have everything that you need to, to stay independent and not end up um, going to the hospital, quite frankly. So it's really, really important stuff. Um, so peace of mind is really important. And it's also important to, to recognize that during a disaster, although we're really fortunate in Idaho that we don't have the kind of battle tempo or battle rhythm that states like Florida and, and California have with kind of these relentless, constant, you know, pounding of hurricanes and fires, um, you know, there, things can still happen in, in Idaho. And, and anyone who's been in a, a disaster, survived a disaster, uh, will tell you that, you know, they, they didn't necessarily think it was going to happen to them, but when it does happen, like you don't have a lot of time to act and you need to, to move quickly, often. Um, and it's also important to know that a lot of the social uh, services and systems that we rely on to be independent might not be functioning during a disaster. So transportation, um, getting access to pharmacies or medical, uh, durable medical supplies, um, even cell phone communication, those things might not work, so you really need to plan, assuming that those those aren't going to exist for a little bit of time. Okay? Anybody have any questions so far? And feel free to just raise your hand or shout out if you've got a question. Um, this doesn't need to be super formal, and I don't need to be up here like I'm running for office or anything. So um, we'll just we'll just keep it fun. Um, okay. Next slide. You got it. You got it. So basically what we want to talk about are four steps to um, being prepared. One is doing a personal assessment um, of your own situation. Uh, the second step is making a kit, an emergency kit, go bag, whatever you want to call it. Um, the third step is making your own personal kind of individualized emergency plan. And then the fourth step is knowing how to be informed about emergencies or disasters if they should happen. Um, so what's a personal assessment? A personal assessment is kind of taking stock of what your particular disability is and all of the things that, that come with that disability that you need to think about if you're stuck at home for three days, five days, or a week, or if you have to leave your home um, and leave that kind of environment that's comfortable that works for you. Um, so you need to think those things through. Let's see. So for instance, equipment. Do you have any kind of special equipment you use? Do you use a manual chair, a power wheelchair, a walker, a cane? Um, do you use uh, any kind of adaptive equipment to communicate? Um, if you do, uh, do you have backups? Do you have ways to charge that equipment? Do you have extra batteries? Um, I, you know, anywhere I travel, I always take an extra two inner tube and a hand pump for my chair because I know that the one time I don't is the one time I'm experiencing a goat head or something um, and I'm just kind of stuck rolling around in a circle. So I, I don't really want to be there. So I kind of think through, you know, an Allen wrench, um, an inner tube, uh, that sort of stuff um, in case, you know, something happens, right? I need to stay mobile and independent. Um, so thinking that through is really important. Um, things like service animals uh, or guide dogs, if you have those, those kinds of resources, um, making sure that you've got food and, and extra water for that animal and that 
you've got uh, maybe paperwork or information about um, uh, you know what uh, what the what that service animal assists you with. Um, you can't really be required to show paperwork, um, you know, on a service animal. It's not really allowed. But in a shelter, so if you were to have to go to a shelter and um, deal with folks who don't know the Americans with Disabilities Act, they may push back and say, well, how do I know this is? So just to be even more prepared, it's good to have that kind of documentation with you um, just to make things go smoothly. So it's vaccinations of your animals and maybe that paperwork and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So think that through. Um, evacuation, what's your plan to evacuate? You know, ideally, I think emergency managers in, in, in you know, Sandy, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not an emergency manager, but I, I think um, most folks would prefer that people had the option of staying home, right? Like not being out on the street, not being where we have to expend resources to, to take care of, of you or other people. And so um, thinking, you know, hopefully in a, in a disaster emergency, we can, we can stay in front of Netflix and popcorn and watch everything go down on the news. Um, that isn't always possible, and sometimes you need to evacuate. Um, so thinking through, you know, do you have a vehicle? If you don't drive or have a vehicle, um, how are you gonna get out? Um, if you rely on public transportation and you have a power chair, which can weigh, you know, it's several hundred pounds, um, do you have uh, friends or other resources, family members who have a vehicle that can help transport you safely? Um, so, you know, thinking those sorts of things through, through how are you going to evacuate? What's your plan? Um, and always take guidance from your emergency managers about evacuation, where you should evacuate to, um, what routes to use, that sort of thing. So, which is where we talk about staying informed. Can I just say? Yes, a, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that we um, learned from, um, I don't know who was here when we had the windstorm a few years ago, um, but people that were on O2 tanks, um, the delivery of them did not happen as timely as they wanted it to. So the, the suppliers, the vendors have actually learned to, when weather is, is going to change, they will actually, in more of our rural areas, um, double their delivery service to um, citizens. So that's just something to think about, whether it's O2 um, uh, prescription drugs or you know something else where you might get a delivery of something. You want to make sure that you have a connection to that vendor. Ask them, what's your plan? What's your plan if there's a disaster? How are you going to be able to continue service to me? Because they all are required to have plans. That's a great example. Uh, I'm going to use that example in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then independent living in, in, your, in your personal assessment. Like, what do you need to, to live independent every day? Um, you know, do you cook for yourself? Or do you have someone help you cook? Do you, you know, uh, using the bathroom? Um, transferring from beds or chairs, things like that, um, communicating with people. Like these are all things that we, um, you know, we craft our life around systems and patterns and resources so that we can, we can do these things independently for the most part. But when a disaster strikes and you have to leave your home or your community and you're, you're in a, a space that's new and unfamiliar and you don't have everything set up just how you, you want it, um, that can be really challenging. So thinking that through is really, really important. Um, okay. Can I say something? Yes. I had called the fire department when I ran out of charge on my chair in case of an emergency, and they can charge your power chair off the fire truck. Oh, cool. As long as you have your charger. Just wait. So it sounds like fire trucks <laughs> might have ability so to like get away charge chairs. From your chair. Yeah. You can still get it charged if it dies. That's good to know. That's good to know. So a mobile generator kind of deal. As yeah. long as the firemen are not <coughs> fighting the fire. Right, right. During the disaster, but yeah. yeah. Um, Another tip you might want to think about is getting an inverter if you have a car. If you have an inverter, you can just plug it into your lighter, and then you have 110, and you can charge your yeah. chair that way, too. I actually have a converter, oh, just it. in case. There you go. <laughs> so I don't have to be able to. So if you... 
So if you have medical equipment that has to be charged, um, James is saying that you, you know, think about an uh, electrical device for your car that allows you to turn power from your vehicle into power that can actually charge equipment like, you know, chairs and things like that. That's a really good, that's a really good idea. Those things aren't necessarily super expensive either, but if you've got a vehicle, um, that might 